We rise now, turning to page one for our opening sentences and our psalm. O Lord, open my lips. And my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste to deliver me, O Lord. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. And we begin this psalm together. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord of God. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he may his to them in his covenants. My eyes are ever toward the Lord. He will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my disasters. Consider my affliction and my trouble, and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes, and with what violent hatred they hate me. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Congregation may be seated as we sing hymn 332, Savior of the Nation, come, or stanzas one through four.
Our first reading for the second midweek in Advent is taken from Genesis chapter 16, beginning at verse 1, and is the basis for the sermon tonight. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant who was named Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Now, behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is, your, is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He, he shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Ber Lahoroi. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. O Lord, have mercy on us. God. Our second reading comes from Galatians chapter 4 and 5, but beginning at verse 21. Paul writes, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, woman, barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at the time, but just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, 
We are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We rise for our third reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being govern, governor of Judea, and Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iteria, and Trachonitis, and Lysanus, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I shall rise, raise up for David a righteous branch. This is the name. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. This is the name by which you will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. This is the name by which you will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. You may be seated as we continue with our hymn of the a sermon hymn, hymn 332, the remainder, verses 5 through 8. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. As you've heard earlier, the text for our, our sermon is taken from Genesis chapter 16. 
And as stated last week, and maybe even on Sunday, we're going through uh, some sons in the past that have not been so good, or some fathers who have not done rightly. And we're going to understand how Christ fulfills all these things. So tonight is, this is my son, Ishmael. When it comes to raising children, surely we've heard a few things before, right? When it comes to raising children, maybe you've heard of some some parenting tactics. One is called the tiger moms. Have you heard of tiger moms? They're really protective of their children, right? They they harbor them, keep them, don't let anybody think happen. The other might be you might have heard is helicopter parents. I don't know which one's worse, but you know they are always hovering around their kids, always hovering. Oh, we've got to keep, got to be in their lives, got to be doing something, making sure they're all they're doing what they're needing to do. But there's a new type of parent pushing its way through the schoolyard. They will stop at nothing to ensure their children's success. Yes, this new type of parenting is called snowplow parenting. (laughs) Look it up. I'm not kidding. There's a whole list of things. I was going to give it to you, but then I thought that might be too precocious of me. These parents are intent on removing any obstacle that is in the way of their child so that their child does not have to face any pain or any difficulty or any failure on their way to that grand success. If their child struggles, the snowplow parent usually takes matters into their own hands and accomplishes the challenges all on their own for the sake of their children. Thinking that they are helping their children without realizing the long-term effects of this approach. I can understand this to some degree because there have been times in my children's life when they've asked me to help them with a, with a school project, you know, those, those making projects that you have to do. And it's just so much easier me for, for me to build it for them, right? Because who's got the time to teach? Who's got the time to make sure they're not struggling? Who's got the time to tell them that doesn't go there again and again and again and again? So it's just easier for us to take over and just let them have the easy road. We tend to take matters into our own hands, not just with our children. When something is not going quite right or something is taking too long, that's the situation that we find Abraham and Sarah in Genesis chapter 16. Abraham had received the promise from God that he would, be, he would be the father of many, and that through his descendants, God would bless the whole world. When God spoke this promise, both Abraham and Sarah believed it, believed this promise. But that promise was made years ago. Abraham and Sarah were not young when God originally made the promise. They certainly weren't getting any younger Plus, Sarah was barren, without child, being not able to have children. Maybe we need to take things into our own hands and force the issue. So Sarah comes up with a plan. Maybe it's just about Abraham. Maybe we only need Abraham for this promise to be fulfilled. So she offers her servant, Hagar, to Abraham that he might obtain children from her. And as what we would call a good husband in our day, Abraham listened to his wife, and Hagar became a parent. It worked. It worked. Or so it seemed. The situation only caused issues with the household of Abraham. Hagar, who was blessed with child, began to look at Sarah with contempt. You know what that is, right? You know what that look looks like. It's when you get something from God that is so grand, you have to look at everybody else around you and lord it over them. You know what that 
twinkle in your eye and that smile that... I don't do the smile. It comes naturally, but when you try to do it not naturally, it's pretty hard. Right? Hagar's behavior got so bad that Sarah returns her bad behavior with her own bad behavior. Because everyone knows two wrongs makes a right. Right? This caused Hagar to flee, but after God clears everything up for Hagar, convinces her to return to Sarah, and that Hagar should be submissive to her, Hagar does return and gives birth to Ishmael. Yet God makes it clear to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17 that despite Abraham's efforts, Ishmael is not the son that God promised. God tells Abraham, you will have a son by Sarah, even though you are now 100 years old and Sarah is 90. So Abraham replies, like any good man would do, oh, that Ishmael would live before you, O Lord. Abraham is trying to demonstrate to God that he has already taken care of the problem. I have a son. No, God says. Sarah, your wife, shall bear a son. (laughs) And guess what you're going to call his name? Isaac. Abraham and Sarah did not have to take matters into their own hands. They didn't have to have a son on their own. They didn't have to kick God's plan to the side. They didn't have to kickstart God's plan of blessing. God was going to take care of fulfilling his promise in his own way and in his own time. So when it comes to the blessings and promises of God for us, we also think like Abraham and Sarah. We think we have to take matters into our own hands when they're not coming quick enough. We imagine that we have to activate We have to activate God's promises by cleaning up our lives or showing him how sincerely and earnestly we believe in him. We think that we can manipulate God by our own good works and force his hand to pour out his blessing on us. Look what I did for you, Lord. You better give me something back. If we just build the right style church, if we have a preschool a grade school, or a high school, then God will send us children. If we just have some passing knowledge of God, of Christ's name, we know his name, but don't push people to understand the depths of his love in his word and sacraments. Then we won't have to worry about offending them, and they'll come in. They'll be part of us. We become impatient with God's plan as we do what he says and as we wait for his promises to come to fruition we grow impatient so we take our relationship with God into our own hands and trust in ourselves to get the job done in order to maintain our status as God's children we imagine that we have got to prove ourselves to him over and over again we all we all tend to exchange our freedom of the gospel for the slavery of the law. Rather than living under the freedom of Jesus' words from the cross, it is finished, and trusting that it is truly finished, we live under the law of slavery. We want to go back to that, which says do more and try harder. In the book of Galatians, Paul repeatedly demonstrates the foolishness of this kind of thinking. In Galatians chapter 3, he writes, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. In chapter 4, which we just heard tonight, Paul supplements his argument with an illustration, the story of Hagar 
and Sarah. Paul says, Now this story may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. She corresponds to present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children, trying to please God by their works. But the Jerusalem, I added that, that's not in the scriptures, but I figured you wanted to have a little bit depth of what that meant. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. In other words, Hagar represents the law and Mount Sinai. And all those who submit to the law submit to slavery of the law and are children of Hagar. They are Ishmael's. St. Paul asks, what eventually happened to Hagar and Ishmael? What does the scripture say? cast out the slave woman and her son. Ishmael was not the son of the promise. He was the son produced by Abraham's efforts, a work of the law. And he was rejected. Ultimately, all who rely on the law will be rejected. But God called Abraham and Sarah to trust, to trust in his promises and to live by faith. God would take care of it, and he does. And though it seemed impossible, everything seems impossible to us. Sarah gave birth to a son, the son of the promise, Isaac. St. Paul explains, Now you brothers like Isaac, are children of promise. We are not, you are not, children of the slave, but of the free woman. Those who live by faith and not by works are sons and daughters of the promise, are sons and daughters of Abraham, and receive God's blessings as such. But it is not faith in Isaac that brings the blessing of God's salvation. It's not that Isaac came. It is the faith in the true son of Abraham. The son through whom the whole world is blessed. The son whose works sets us free from the slavery of the law. God, our loving father, has removed all obstacles to us for our salvation. Because he knew that you and I could never do it on our own no matter how hard we try. He sent his only begotten son into this world and called his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And that is exactly what Jesus does for you. This son would also be born through miraculous circumstances, not by the will of any man or woman, not through an old barren woman, but through another impossible action, a virgin woman and the Holy Spirit. And this son would also walk up a mountain to be sacrificed. But unlike Isaac, God did not stop the hands that placed the crown of thorns on, on his son's head. He did not stop the hands that nailed the nails into his hands and into his feet of his very own son. Jesus completed the work of the law, suffered the consequences of our sins, suffering our desire to make God work for us in the way that we want him to work and how we want him to work. That lack of faith and that lack of trust is forgiven. Jesus has won our freedom from self-righteous works. He declared it as he was dying on the cross. It is finished. Your sins I cover with my most holy and precious blood. There's nothing you can add. Jesus is the true son of Abraham 
whose eternal blessings are received only by faith. And as Holy Scripture tells us, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. As for many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if you have put on Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. You are heirs according to the promise. There's a song from my youth, a hymn from my youth, that I'm sure I've sung to you many times, but you get to bear it again. (laughs) Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. You and I are sons of the promise, sons of Abraham, children of God, through the true and only Son, Jesus Christ. So let's all praise the Lord. Amen. We rise now for our antiphon and magnificat. Found on page 7. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For behold, from this day all generations will call me blessed. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has exalted the lowly. He has has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers to Abraham and to his seed forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated for the offering, and I encourage you to grab those attendance books located in the center aisles, and please fill those out. We rise now for the Kyrie and the Lord's Prayer. And we speak together. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, O Lord, hear my prayer. And let my cry come to you. Almighty God, 
You have granted precious and great promises to all who believe, all things that pertain to life and godliness. Focus our faith on the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory, that we may be your true sons and daughters in your eternal kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord God, you demonstrated your might and grace by providing your servants Abraham and Sarah with a son of your own promise. Guide our faith to be always in the true son of Abraham, your only son, Jesus, the promise of our salvation and life, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, from whom comes all holy desires, all good counsels and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen.